Jason Corbett was known for being a family man through and through. He loved his kids more than anything and was willing to do whatever it took to keep them safe and happy. But according to detectives and even some of the crime scene investigators, there was much more to Jason's story than meets the eye. Police have conflicting opinions about this case. Some officers believe that Jason truly was the family man he portrayed himself to be. But others believe he had a dark side that only showed up behind closed doors. Whatever the case, in August of 2015, Jason lost his life in one of the most vicious crimes I've ever covered here on True Crime Stories. But what makes this case so incredibly disturbing isn't just that someone took Jason's life, it's who took it and why. Jason Corbett was born and raised in Limerick, Ireland. His two children, 10-year-old Jack and 8-year-old Sarah, were the light of his world, and he did all he could to make sure that they had the best life possible. But unfortunately, Jason couldn't protect his kids from one of the most tragic days of their lives. See, when their kids were very young, their mother, Margaret, passed away unexpectedly from a severe asthma attack. Her passing came as a complete shock to the family and was particularly devastating for Jason, as you can probably imagine. While Margaret had issues with asthma in the past, no one expected her to lose her life in such a sudden, painful, and terrifying series of events. It was just so out of left field. This tragedy left Jason in a really difficult spot. Considering Jason was a plant manager for an international packaging company, his job required him to spend large amounts of time away from his children. Before, Margaret would help pick up the slack and ensure the kids had a pretty normal home life. But now that she was gone, well, it was incredibly difficult for the young family. It didn't take Jason long at all to admit that he needed help and quickly. This led him to find the help of a woman named Molly Martins, who offered to help look after the children for Jason while he was at work. But the thing about Molly is that she lived in the United States, halfway across the world from Jason in Ireland. She agreed to move in with the family, crossing the ocean over to Ireland. In, in exchange, Jason would help her get citizenship there. Molly has been described as an au pair, or here in America, many people refer to this type of situation as a mail order bride, but that's admittedly a pretty derogatory term if you ask me, and it oversimplifies what's usually a pretty complicated situation for the men and women who choose this sort of job. Truth be told, Molly didn't seem to have any nefarious intentions. She wasn't moving here with the hopes of becoming Jason's wife, nor did she plan on essentially becoming a replacement for the children's mother. But by the end of it all, that is exactly what happened. Now, Molly insists that she didn't have an ulterior motive when she moved in with Jason, but considering Jason is no longer around to tell his side of the story, we'll never really know what his intentions were. But considering this guy was so dedicated to making sure his children were safe and cared for, I'd find it hard to believe if he had any hidden intentions either. But either way, the relationship between Jason and Molly began innocently enough at first. But before long, the two had fallen for each other. But rather than remain in Ireland, the family now decided that their best chance at getting a fresh start would be to move to the United States. And that's exactly what they did, finding a place to call home in Davidson County, North Carolina. That same year, Jason and Molly officially tied the knot and got married. Everything went amazingly well for the family for the first several years. Jason went to work at the packaging plant while Molly helped out around the house and with the children, and eventually even took on a role of a children's swimming coach. But by the end of August of 2015, things had changed. In the early hours of the morning, a 911 call rang through to emergency operators. On the other end of the line was Molly's father, Tom. My daughter's husband, um, my son-in-law, um, got in a fight with my daughter. I intervened, and I, I think um, he's in bad shape. We need help. Okay, what do you mean he's in bad shape? He's hurt? He's, he's bleeding all over, and I, I may have killed him. Molly's father, Tom, a former FBI agent, had been spending some time with the family, visiting with his daughter, her new husband, and his newfound grandchildren. When the entire family was asleep, but all of a sudden, around 3 a.m. in the morning, Molly says that Sarah, their youngest daughter, woke up from a bad dream in a panic, believing that the fairies that were printed on her bedsheets were actually lizards and bugs. 
Molly ran in to calm the girl down with Jason close behind. But Molly suggests that rather than being calm and understanding of the girl's bad dream, Jason flew into a fit of rage. He began shouting at Molly as if this were somehow her fault. The two quickly got into a heated argument, and that's when Jason reportedly grabbed Molly by the throat. And that's when Tom walked in and, as he put it, intervened. By the time Tom was finished with Jason, he was left lying on the floor, bleeding profusely. Tom immediately called 911 for help. The 911 operator told Tom how to administer CPR, and he and Molly took turns doing this until paramedics arrived, less than 10 minutes later. But by the time they got to Jason's side, there was nothing they could do. He was gone. To say they found Jason in a bad state, well, that doesn't even begin to describe it. The amount of anger that Tom unleashed on Jason was unreal. This man had trauma consistent with being struck by a car or falling off a cliff, not being restrained by his father-in-law. When detectives showed up a short while later, they admitted that evidence was everywhere. They collected forensic samples from the floor, the walls, the bed, everywhere. This attack had clearly dragged on for quite some time, and Tom just wasn't letting up. As investigators began combing through all the clues and evidence left around the scene of the crime, they found a 28-inch baseball bat that had been leaning against a dresser in the couple's bedroom. It's believed that this was the primary item that was used to, in Tom's words, intervene. But as they kept looking, they noticed a small brick paver had also been dropped in the bedroom. This paver was found to have been covered in blood, which wasn't painting a good picture of what had unfolded here. When Molly and Tom were asked to come by the police station to issue a statement, Molly told detectives the story of Sarah waking up and being frightened by the characters printed on her bedsheets. Tom explained how he'd heard a commotion and went inside the bedroom to find Jason holding Molly by her neck, and that's when he jumped in. At this point, police were uncertain of how to proceed. If the attack had taken place exactly as these two claimed, well, then Jason likely lost his life in a bit of self-defense. Case closed. But considering the detectives found two separate weapons at the crime scene, both of which had clearly been used against Jason, this was beginning to look like something much more nefarious. Police were now looking more closely at the crime scene. When officers arrived at the home that morning, there was one particular scenario that just didn't make sense to them. If Tom stated that he'd woken up after hearing a commotion, and Molly stated that Sarah had woken up shouting out of fear, and their fight began immediately afterward, then wouldn't the children have heard the struggle? Yet, when investigators arrived, both of the children were fast asleep in their bedrooms as if nothing happened. This led police to a frightening theory. Jason didn't attack Molly that evening. In fact, he couldn't have. That's because when the crime unfolded, Jason was fast asleep. As police continued to dig deeper and deeper into the situation, they'd convinced themselves that Molly and Tom had to be lying. The evidence just wasn't adding up to the story these two had told to investigators. This is when they decided to press charges against both Molly and Tom for second-degree homicide, as well as voluntary manslaughter. It would now be up to the jury to decide who did what and how exactly this crime had played out. The defense team, the team working for Molly and Tom, painted Jason as being an angry, bitter man who would often lash out at Molly. But the prosecution, the team working on Jason's behalf, insisted that there was no indication and no evidence that Jason was an angry or violent person. He'd never exhibited this behavior before, and no one had anything bad to say about him. On the evening of the crime, Jason even offered to help bring Molly's parents' luggage inside for them, as they'd obviously planned on spending the night with them. He all around seemed like a great, family-oriented man. The family's neighbor admitted that he'd never really noticed any aggression between Tom and Molly. He even stated that Jason was known for his very calm demeanor. The two had actually been hanging out all afternoon on that day, and he said that nothing seemed out of the ordinary about Jason. They'd been chatting from about 3.30 p.m. to about 8.30 p.m. that afternoon, and their get-together only stopped when Molly's parents pulled up in the driveway, at which point Jason left to greet them. The neighbor added that when Jason saw them pulling up, his demeanor didn't change one bit. It was still completely calm, and he may have even been happy to see them. This is when detectives began to dig up some suspicious evidence against Molly and Tom. It would come to light that Jason had been making plans to move back to Ireland, but Molly didn't want to go. Jason felt that it would be best for his kids and for the family as a whole 
But Molly was strictly against this idea. She feared that if she didn't agree, Jason may even take the children and move countries without her. And this wasn't just some theory that police concocted, this was somewhat of a proven fact. Evidence was later shown to the court that proved that Tom had struck Jason with a bat on the evening of the crime, and Molly openly admitted to striking Jason with the brick paver that was found in the bedroom. According to Tom and Molly, as soon as Jason fell to the ground, their attack stopped and they immediately called 911. But one of the paramedics noticed something odd. There was dried blood on Jason's body. The paramedics had arrived in less than 10 minutes, so how could this have already dried? One of the paramedics spoke at the trial and admitted that the scene of the crime was beyond gruesome. The trauma that was noted to Jason's head was just downright repulsive. There was nothing left of him. This was leading the court to a fairly universal opinion. This crime was no accident. Molly's parents hadn't just happened to stop by for the night, and that's because they've been planning on taking Jason's life all along. When Chief Medical Examiner Craig Nelson testified in the court proceedings, he announced that the cause of Jason's passing was rather obviously blunt force trauma. He noted a total of 12 injuries to Jason's skull, with several of these injuries showing repeated blows. He concluded that Jason had been struck in the head over a dozen times, but he believed this number could have been much, much higher. There just wasn't any way to say for certain, as there was nothing left of the guy. But this is where things get very interesting. When a toxicology report was done on Jason's body, it was found that he had a small amount of alcohol in his system, likely from when he was hanging out with his neighbor. But he also had trazodone in his system. Interestingly, trazodone is considered to be an antidepressant, but Jason wasn't considered to be depressed, nor had any doctor ever prescribed him this medication. This is when the family's doctor was asked to take the stand. When questioned about this medication, she admitted that Molly had recently come in and claimed that she was having trouble sleeping. Trazodone, as it turns out, isn't actually very effective at treating depression, but it works great for helping you fall asleep. Thus, Molly was given a prescription for the medication, not Jason. When Molly was initially taken in for questioning after calling 911 that night, detectives took several photos of her to document any injuries that she may have incurred at the hands of Jason, but there were none. She was completely clean aside from a small amount of Jason's blood that was on her. During her interrogation, she was seen repeatedly pulling and grasping at her own neck, to which an officer requested that she stop. But all throughout the interview, she just kept grabbing at her neck, as if she was trying to hurt herself. Maybe so that she'd have bruises show up in the photos later on, but this obviously didn't work if it truly was her plan. When Tom was questioned, there were no injuries or bruises found on him either. Both of these two were completely free and clear. Now, to be fair, when paramedics arrived at the scene, they did note that Molly had a bit of redness on her neck, but they also noticed that she kept grabbing at her own neck the entire time they were there as well. So it's unclear whether this redness would have come from an injury or if it was just the fact that she kept grabbing it herself. It would then come to light that Molly had also been struggling with some mental health issues, but it's not clear if these were previous issues or current issues she was dealing with. But whatever the case, the prosecution suggested that her mental health issues caused her to repeatedly ask Jason to allow her to officially adopt his children. Though, let's be real, the two had been married four or five years. It's not particularly unusual for a new spouse to want to adopt her stepchildren. But either way, Jason wasn't okay with this, and he repeatedly denied her request, which caused an understandable amount of anger in Molly. Molly was deeply in love with these children, and according to one report, one of her biggest fears was that Jason would one day take the children away from her. But it's never been explained why she believed this. After all, the two were married, their lives were tightly intertwined, and they were reportedly quite happy with one another. So unless she had underlying abandonment issues, I just can't understand why she would be so terrified of losing these kids. But then came the most shocking revelation of all the insurance policy. As it turns out, Jason had quite a bit of money. In fact, when they purchased their super nice home in North Carolina, he paid for the entire thing in cash, just wired the money right over to the United States without even being there in person. He also wired money over to pay for furniture. We're talking hundreds upon thousands of dollars. He even wired a $49,000 payment to Molly's father around this same time. And the note attached to this payment simply read, for the marriage. 
This payment has never been explained, but considering Molly was proven to have been an au pair, well, many people are a bit suspicious about this payment. When it was revealed that Jason's life insurance policy totaled around $600,000, there was a very clear image appearing here, and it didn't paint Molly or her father in a very good light. When you combine this with the fact that Molly refused to testify at trial, well, I don't know about you, but that's just downright suspicious. With all of this evidence stacked against her, the only reason I can come up with that would cause her to refuse to testify would simply be that she didn't want to be caught in a lie. After all, her father was a former FBI agent, so he would likely be pretty good at keeping a story straight. But when you throw Molly into the mix, well, that makes two potential points of failure rather than one. So it's best for their sake that she remain silent. But again, this is just a theory. Molly claims that Jason had been abusive toward her all throughout their marriage, but not a single shred of evidence was found to prove this. She never filed any police reports against him, and no one in the local community had anything bad to say about him. Molly insisted that Jason's children be asked to give a statement at the trial, insisting their version of events would perfectly line up with what she and her father had been claiming unfolded that night. But the children had already been taken back home to Ireland, presumably to live with Tom's parents. Because of this, their statements were never heard by the jury. But here's where things, once again, get very interesting. The defense team was able to dig up two interviews that were conducted with Jason's children. One interview was taken on the day that he lost his life, and another was taken after his funeral. In these reports, what the children had to say about their father was not nice. These interviews conducted with Jason's children really call this whole case into question and really make you wonder if Molly and Tom may actually have been telling the truth. A social worker who was employed by the Union County Department of Social Services conducted the interviews with each of the kids. Both of the children referred to Jason getting mad at Molly, and they claimed that this would happen on a regular basis. They also claimed to have once witnessed Jason grab Molly by the hair and, quote, smack her in the face. In another interview, the children reported that Jason would get angry over simple things such as bills or leaving the lights on. The kids each referred to multiple instances where Jason would hurt Molly. In one interview, Sarah explained that she would occasionally have nightmares and Molly would come in to comfort her in the middle of the night. She continued by saying that her father would sometimes get incredibly angry if she accidentally woke him up. Now, one thing that a lot of us have probably been asking is, what about the brick paver that Molly used to attack Jason? I don't know about you, but it always seems suspicious to me. Who keeps a brick in their bedroom? Well, the children explained this too. They claimed that they planned on painting the brick with Molly as a decoration, but that day it had been raining, so they weren't able to get the brick painted. In the end, none of these statements from the children were allowed to be used at the trial, as the children had already left the country. This meant that when all was said and done, both Molly and Tom were found guilty and they were each sentenced to 25 years behind bars. But all hope was not lost. Both Tom and Molly appealed their sentences. Molly's first attempt failed, but after a while, they were both allowed to bring their appeals before the North Carolina Supreme Court. Here, the court ruled that the two were allowed to be released on a bail of $200,000 each pending a retrial. They were both ordered to give up their passports, and they were not allowed to make any contact with either Jack or Sarah. But believe it or not, the twists in this story aren't over. After Molly and Tom were released, the children were finally able to be contacted for a follow-up interview. During this interview, they both admitted that they were, quote, coached to lie in their statements, admitting that none of the domestic abuse ever happened. They furthered this by saying that Molly was the one who convinced them to lie to the police, as well as to the social worker. So with all that said, where does this leave us? Well, it was announced in June of 2024 that a retrial had been completed. Both Molly and Tom took a plea deal in which they both pleaded guilty to charges of manslaughter. They each could have been held in prison for up to an additional 17 years, but the judge decided to only sentence them to 51 months each while also giving them credit for the time they'd already served. When you consider that they each already spent about four years in prison, that meant that their time was essentially already completed. I'll save you the math and just say that four years is equivalent to about 48 months. In the end, they each served about an additional seven months in prison, and they were now allowed to walk free. So at the end of the day, I'm not sure what to say about this case. 
Were Tom and Molly truly defending themselves that evening? I don't know. Were the kids lying when they mentioned the abuse Molly had endured, or were they actually lying about lying? No one really knows. All we know for sure is that Jason lost his life that day, and innocent or not, that simply didn't deserve to happen. Even if we assume that Jason was the monster Molly made him out to be, who is she to decide whether he lives or dies? Everyone deserves a chance at redemption, and if Jason was as violent and angry as Molly claims, calling the police would have been the best option. Though I do admit, in abusive relationships, sometimes this only makes things worse when there truly is no way to escape. On the other hand, if Molly and Tom made the whole thing up, then this innocent man lost his life for no reason at all. Literally, no reason at all. Because Molly isn't even eligible for the life insurance payout now that she pleaded guilty as part of the plea deal. This case is just tragic from all angles, and I just hate it for Jason's kids more than anything. Because regardless of whether he was an angry man or one of the greatest fathers to ever live, every child deserves to spend a childhood with their parents. But for these two incredibly unfortunate souls, both of their parents have now been taken away. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.